I want to give a special thanks to my friend and colleague, Senator Gerald Neal, whom we need. I feel so much better. Your presence is greatly appreciated. Uh, this is the time of year where we struggle to make quorum sometimes because of committee obligations and other things, and where our attention's pulled in a lot of different ways. So members, I appreciate it. Uh, I want to jump right in as soon as we have the roll call. Robert, go ahead. Senator Berg. Present. Senator Carroll. Here. Senator Deneen. Here. Senator Neal. Present. Senator Schickel. Senator Stivers. Senator Storm. Here. Senator Turner. Senator Wheeler. Chair Westerfield. Here. Seeing that we have a quorum, just barely, uh, we are still authorized to do business. Uh, as Representative Lockett is getting situated up at the table, he's where we're starting since he was a holdover from our last committee meeting. And if your guests here in a moment would introduce themselves. But I want to recognize my guests. I've got the Leadership Hopkinsville class from the Christian County Chamber here. Just raise your hand. That's uh, all the finest folks in the Commonwealth here with us today. I uh, want to welcome them. Uh, they've been making a, an annual trip the last couple of years to, uh, to spend some time in Frankfurt with us, so we're glad to have you guys. Um, in, members, anybody else have any guests they want to recognize? All right, seeing none. Representative Lockett, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Matt Lockett. I'm the state representative out of the 39th district, and I will let my guests introduce themselves. Before they do that, let me say what I should have said to begin with. We have four bills and about 50 minutes left, so be mindful of that time. You can make it quick, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Indeed. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you all for having us. <laughs> <laughs> On consent. <laughs> Rui Zakaria, the criminal chief at the Office of the Attorney General. Good morning. My name is Matt Hedden. I'm the director of special victims for the Attorney General's office. Good morning. I'm Hillary Sykes, and I'm here as a supporter of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to very briefly walk through House Bill 278. Um, I want to first give you the reason why we are bringing this bill. Um, I, was, I, was, um, I was looking at a recent survey completed by the CDC entitled The National Survey of Children's Exposure to Violence, and it found the following stats. The one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused before they turn 18 years old. Over 16% of girls, 14 to 17 years old, experienced a sexual offense. 14.3% of girls ages 14 to 17 years old experienced a sexual assault. 6% of boys ages 14 to 17 experienced a sexual assault. Sexual assault by a known adult occurs to 14 to 4.3 percent of all girls ages 14 to 17 and to 1.1 percent of all boys the same age. And it's estimated that 325,000 children per year become victims of sex trafficking. Now, those numbers to me are very frightening. And I believe it's time that we do our part to severely punish those that would do harm to our children. So House Bill 278, um, I would like to go through very briefly each section uh, just to describe what they do. So Section 1 simply adds childhood sexual assault and abuse to the JC3 reporting form that is used by law enforcement. Section 2 states that a superintendent of schools shall not employ in any position any person that has been convicted of any offense that would classify him or her as a violent offender or that has been convicted of a sex crime or a misdemeanor sex crime or if they have been required to register as a sex offender. And I, firm, I firmly believe that we need to keep these abusers out of our schools and away from our children. Section uh, three removes the statute of limitations on childhood sexual assault or abuse. Our current law states that a person has 10 years to report that assault with the latest timing being 10 years past the age of 18. 
Therefore, 28 years old would be the latest age that someone could report a personal childhood sexual assault or abuse. We also know that the average age that a person discloses their childhood sexual assault is close to 40 years old, well beyond our current statute. And it's important to, to also note that this uh, provision is not, re is not retroactive and does not include um, those persons whose statute has already expired. Sections four and five increase uh, the, the felony class for rape and sodomy in the second degree from class C to a class B if the defendant is a, a person in a position of authority or trust, such as a teacher or a pastor. Section six raises the felony level to, to a class C um, for solicitation of a minor using electronic systems, computers, or cell phones. Section seven increases the penalty for human trafficking to a class B felony. And if the victim is, is under the age of 18, it rises to a class A felony. Section eight uh, raises the penalty for promoting human trafficking to a class C felony. And if the victim is, is under the age of 18, it raises the penalty to a class B. And section nine deals with the distribution of child pornography. HB 278 says that if a person is knowingly distributing matter of a minor less than 18, it is a class C felony. If the minor is under the age of 12, it is a class B felony. So that is in general House Bill 278, and we'll certainly take any questions that you may have. I don't see any questions at this time. Members, I'll make a motion on the bill. Is there a second? Second from Senator Carroll. Members, I'll point out there was a proposed sub sent yesterday evening, uh, and that's through no fault of the sponsor or the, the senator behind uh, the language there. Um, we've been having some LRC computer and server issues the last couple of days, as I'm sure several of you are aware, and they just couldn't get that prepared in time. So it, it didn't hit the 24-hour rule, so it's not for us today. You were sent that. I think that's probably going to end up as a floor amendment to the bill, and I think they've been in touch with you, Representative Lockett, to mm -hmm. discuss that. Um, I'm not saying I'm for or against that language. I'm just making sure members are aware since they were sent that, that language last night. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the bill. I don't see any other questions. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Berg. Aye. Senator Carroll. Aye. Senator Deneen. Aye. Senator Neal. Aye. Senator Schickel. Aye. Senator Stivers. Aye. Senator Storm. Aye. Senator Turner. Can I explain my vote? Yes, sir. It's my no vote. And the basis of my no vote, I was the one that filed that amendment and didn't wasn't aware of the time frame. I didn't get the bill and 24 hours beforehand. And I do have some concern with it having a no statute of limitations, meaning that somebody today could be 20 years old and 60 years from now get sued civilly for something that all the people are dead and gone or anybody that would defend them and all that. It's a total elimination of all statute limitations in the bill. And that's the problem I have with it. Uh, and that's my basis for vote no and so it doesn't go on the consent calendar. Senator Wheeler. Aye. Chair Westerfield. Aye. Bill passes with favorable expression on a seven to one, I think that's right, vote. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Sykes, good to see you. All right. Is Chair Moser with us? <laughs> right, right in front of me. Come on up. House Bill 385, an act relating to mental capacity. Um, and I figured you might be joined by some colleagues. Uh, Chairwoman Moser, you have the floor when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee members, for giving us the opportunity to discuss this. Um, it's a small but important change. Uh, how, I, I'm Representative Kim Mosier. I represent the 64th District, for the record. 
and I will have my guests in, introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Colleen Flesher. I'm the director of Kentucky Correctional Psychiatric Center. If you would try Start that one over. more time. Hello, I'm Colleen Slusher. I'm the director of the Kentucky Correctional Psychiatric Center, KCPC. Good morning, Stacy Tapke, the Kenton County Attorney. And Katie Comstock, AOC Director. So um, very quickly, and I'll let my guest elaborate on some of this, but three, House Bill 385 is a bill which allows a close friend who meets requirements to step in when a family member is not available to make health care decisions in the event that an individual is deemed by their physician to lack decisional capacity or has not executed a, um, an advanced directive. The change in competency evaluations will ensure that individuals receive needed services more quickly and that victims receive justice in a timely manner. Section one outlines the, that individuals um, who are eligible to be a guardian are listed in order of priorities, ending with the adult friend of the patient who, <clears throat> excuse me, has maintained regular contact with the patient and is familiar with the patient's activities, health, religious, and moral beliefs. Sections two through five outline the procedures for the competency evaluations, and my guests will explain all of uh, these changes, including guardianship and the re reasons for these changes. And then sec section six uh, names this legislation Seth's Law, and this is uh, in a young man, Seth Stevens, who uh, was a talented young attorney uh, for the Kentucky Judicial Commission on Mental Health, who tragically lost his life to suicide this past summer. So this bill comes out of a recommendation from the Guardianship and Commitment Work Group of the Kentucky Judicial Commission on Mental Health, of which we are all a part. And um, it's uh, the commission, uh, which was initiated by AOC. So I will hand it off to um, my, my guest to further explain um, maybe the competency evaluations and uh, anything else that you want to elaborate on. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. So this bill, this bill will allow um, the, the Commonwealth to move towards an outpatient process for competency to stand trial evaluations. Um, KCPC serves felony level cases for all 120 counties, but our other psychiatric hospitals cover the competency evaluations for misdemeanor offenses, and this will allow all of the entire system to move towards an outpatient modality, which is defined as outside of an inpatient setting. So it can be a jail-based. Um, we do many of them through video conference means. KCPC began this process through a pilot in around the summer of 2022 and throughout the last Almost two years, we've developed partnerships with 122 correctional facilities to allow us to facilitate these evaluations. Our data indicates that 70% of people who are evaluated are opined as competent, so it allows the system to move more expeditiously. We complete these evaluations in around three to five weeks from the time we receive the court order and um, move people through the criminal justice system, which allows for resolution. It also frees up bed space for inpatient settings for those defendants who need inpatient restoration services at KCPC or at our psychiatric hospitals. We've modeled this legislation after Tennessee. They have been operating through outpatient modality since 1974. So we've been able to consult with them around um, how this can benefit the service that we all need um, to improve in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Got a motion from Senator Berg. Is there a second? Second. Second from Senator Carroll. Any questions, members? I'm just disappointed Director Comstock didn't have a lengthy report to share with the committee. But I, I want to thank uh, AOC, Director Comstock, um, uh, Deputy Justice Lambert, uh, uh, who chairs the commission. Uh, and all the members, and it's a huge group. I'm proud to be part of it. I know, uh, Chairwoman, you're part of it as well. I'm thankful for the work, and I'm glad to hear the bill. I'm glad we could finally get it on the agenda um, and, and pass it clean here this morning. Seeing no questions and there being a motion and a second on the bill, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Berg. Aye. Senator Carroll. Aye. Senator Deneen. Aye. Senator Neal. Aye. 
Senator Schickel. Senator Stivers. Senator Storm. Explain my yes vote. Uh, yes, please. Thank you to the bill sponsor. Uh, you and I spoke yesterday. My only concern with this uh, was changing the, uh, the the requirement of a defendant to notify of a potential defense regarding this issue regarding competency, and it changes it to conform with the criminal rule. I understand that, but yeah. I would prefer to see the criminal rule conform with the statute. So mm -hmm. um, it moves it from 20 days up to 90. I understand the the uh, intent there, but I would. Uh, um, like to see some sort of modification of that in the future as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Turner. Aye. Senator Wheeler. Aye. Chair Westerfield. Aye. Bill passes with favorable consent, I believe unanimously, and I would move for its consent calendar placement. I have a second from uh, Senator Storm. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? It's on consent. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate again, it. Thank give you. my thanks to Deputy Chief Justice Lambert. Thank you. All right, Representative Dietz, if you're here, there you are. House Bill 436, an act relating to guardians ad litem. Representative, you have the floor when you get situated. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for hearing this bill. Um, Stephanie Dietz from the 65th District, and I'll let my guests introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Judge Jeanette Karam uh, with the Court of Appeals. Good morning. I'm Patricia Summey. I'm a Kenton Circuit Court Judge, General Jurisdiction. Uh, members of the committee, um, House Bill 436 uh, is going to mandate the appointment of a guardian ad litem when a petition is filed for an interpersonal protective order, IPO, or for uh, an order of protection, an EPO, for a child when they are named as a respondent or a petitioner and is an alleged victim of dating violence and abuse, sexual assault, or stalking. House Bill 436 also, we'll codify some language from a case from the Supreme Court that Judge Karam is going to speak about. It will also give contempt powers to the court. And then lastly, we've added language to KRS 26A140 that directs the Finance and Administration Cabinet to pay the fixed fee by the court when an authorized GAL is appointed to represent child victims in criminal cases. So that part of the statute was lacking, and I will let Judge Summey speak to that. So at this point, I will turn this over to Judge Karen. Good morning. Uh, this legislation was born out of a case uh, that was uh, began in 2018. A mom had filed a petition for protection for her child, um, and the allegations were that her child was sexually assaulted on a school bus. Um, by another child, both minor children. When they came to court, uh, the mom of the victim um, had hired an attorney for that child. However, the alleged um, perpetrator, uh, the respondent in this case, minor child, um, showed up with his mom and uh, had no representation. And the Supreme Court stepped in and said, that's just not acceptable that both um, children that are in this kind of litigation need to be represented, whether they're the victim or whether they are the respondent on these, uh, in these cases. Um, and so since 2021, when this case um, was finalized by the Supreme Court, uh, we've had attorneys who have been volunteering, basically, to act as guardian ad litems. And it's important to note that a guardian ad litem is an attorney who acts in the best interest of the child. So they don't have an agenda. They listen to the parents. They listen to the child. But they do what is in the best interest, so a neutral um, kind of representation. And um, but these lawyers, uh, they're so dedicated, they've been doing it. And on the, it's basically on the hope that they would get paid, because, as you know, the judiciary has no ability to create a financial um, base for these attorneys to get paid. So uh, we've had some attorneys that have been paid and some attorneys that haven't. It's been kind of hit or miss. Um, so that's where this law sprouted from. And um, it also codifies some of the confidentiality aspects of the case as well. 
Judge Semi. Oh. That was quick. I'm never <laughs> that quick. It's good to be with you again and good to see you. The second part of this uh, bill K talks to KRS 26A140, and it is here in that statute was passed in 1992. It's nestled in Chapter 26A entitled Court of Justice Facilities and Services because the primary goal of the most of the subsections of this statute was to shield child victim witnesses physically in the courtroom from the environment created by the Commonwealth, the jury, and the defendant. Because of its initial Second. courtroom facilities issue, yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> You know me too well. <laughs> you can interrupt the judge. I'm not going to do it. Uh, we do have a motion from Senator Wheeler and a second from Senator Turner, or I might have had that reversed, but either way, uh, I heard both voices uh, to my left. Uh, we do have a question from Senator Carroll. Uh, thank you all for uh, explaining the bill. And I, I had a fairly lengthy discussion with uh, uh, Katie yesterday on this bill and, and the first thing that came to mind when I read through this with the guardian ad litem and and I, I understand and I support the intent but I had some concerns about uh, let's say you've got a single mom who may be in the hospital and there is a court appearance she has no ability to direct uh, her child uh, there is someone stepping in that's going to be in some ways guiding that child and, and if they remain totally neutral I, I get that but I I just had some concerns about the parental rights and and someone within the court system stepping in and, and kind of in their place if they're unable to be there and I know in many cases the parent just doesn't show up and there's just not that type of uh, uh, concern or the parents just aren't really that involved in their child's life and I and I get those cases but that 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 came to mind and you know we've passed a lot of legislation to protect parental rights recently and this just so you all and I it's not that I'm not okay with the bill I am but help me get a little bit more comfortable with that part of it um, so inherent in the legislation that governs guardian ad litems is the mandate that they um, represent the best interest of the child and uh, I think in that mandate is the responsibility for them to take into consideration what the parents want. And oftentimes with these protective orders, a parent is the person or guardian is the person who has actually filed. So they're going to be there or a judge would continue the case until that petitioner is there. Um, and, and then on the respondent side, you know, the, the judge would also want that input. So that's also incumbent upon the judge to make sure that they, they get some input from the parent. But I think it's inherent in that statute that governs the guardian ad litems that, that that's exactly what they do. You also have cases sometimes where um, you might have one parent filing against another on behalf of the child. And certainly in those, that's where you really need the neutral party, right? Um, I think you need it no matter what, but you want them to be able to listen to both sides and you want them to say, this is in the best interest of the child, no matter who the petitioner is or who the respondent is. Does, does this bill change? I don't think it does, so I, I'm just asking to give you a chance to answer. Does the bill change that standard, that best interest standard of care, it does so not. to speak, for GALs? It does not. And does it change the court's role as the decision maker uh, in the proceedings that are in front of the court? It does not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Wheeler. I guess I was just discussing it with my colleague, Senator Storm. I mean, generally the purpose of the guardian ad litem is not necessarily to give legal advice in the sense of uh, practicing the case, just to make sure like a minor would not get railroaded with bad advice. Is that not correct? Well, no, that's actually, um, they are representing the child. Yeah. But in the nature of, in the best interest. In the best so, interest, yeah. Yes. I mean, they're not going to, yeah. Any other questions, members? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second on the bill. Mr. Secretary, would you please call the roll? Senator Berg. Aye. <clears throat> Senator Carroll. Aye. Senator Deneen. Aye. Senator Neal. Aye. Senator Schickel. Aye. Senator Stivers. Senator Storm. Aye. Senator Turner. I vote. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for bringing this bill as a uh, old practicing lawyer who's represented many, many of them. I understand it's a total neutral 
basically if the public wants to hear it, a free lawyer that represents the best interest of that child. Parent, in, parent discussion, relative discussion, everybody can be involved in it, but you are designated to represent the best interest of that child. It's like somebody hired you as a free lawyer. Is that not, that's the purpose of it in my understanding of it? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Wheeler. Aye. Chair Westerfield. Aye. Bill passes with favorable expression on an eight to nothing vote. Motion for consent made by the chair. Is there a second? Second, second from Senator Deneen. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? It is on consent. Thank you both. Thank you, Representative. And our last bill, and what might be the last bill I hear as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, because uh, we don't currently have another meeting scheduled. It's no pressure, Representative Wilson. Uh, House Bill 619, an act relating to terms of imprisonment. Uh, a bill to uh, respond to, I don't want to steal your thunder, but respond to a Kentucky Supreme Court ruling that messed things up. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Representative Nick Wilson, uh, 82nd District, all of Whitley County and portion of Laurel County. And my name is Denise Durbin. I am special counsel to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, you're correct. This bill would uh, correct some inconsistencies in, in two separate sentencing laws that was pointed out by the Supreme Court last year in Kimmel versus Commonwealth. Um, basically, there is one of our sentencing laws says that if a, an offense is committed while on probation, parole, or on bond, that the sentence for that criminal action would run consecutive to the prior offense. The, then there's the PFO statute that says for Class C or D, the maximum penalty is 20 years. So what House Bill 619 would do would say that the language of it running consecutive on probation, parole, or on bond running consecutive, that trumps the other language. Uh, the fact pattern of Kimmel versus Commonwealth was uh, the defendant committed a burglary, was let on bond, <clears throat> committed another burglary, and then had a jury trial. He was given 20 years on one burglary, a jury trial, given 20 years on the other burglary. The Supreme Court ruled that it went over 20 years and 20 was the max. The, the intent of, of the statute is if there is an incident of multiple class C or D felonies, say if someone went on a burglary spree this weekend, then that would be capped at 20 years. However, not if someone commits burglary, then is on bond or on parole or, or on probation, then then all of it would be 20 years. That's not, that's not the intent of the PFO statute. And I'll let her give some more uh, fact patterns, but it's, it's a really s scary thought to think that someone could be on parole, commit multiple Class C and D felonies with zero, at risk of having zero more time served added to their sentence because they're already capped out. And I don't believe that's the intent of, of the 20-year max. Thank you, Representative, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I guess I should add, uh, my my career has almost exclusively been in the criminal justice system, including as a felony prosecutor and um, formerly with the Office of Victims Advocacy. Um, and as Representative Wilson indicated, I, um, I can provide a pretty classic. There are, as Representative Wilson said, there are two subsections that are um, discussed in the Kimmel case, and one is the probation or parole, um, and that under a statute that should be consecutive. That's already an existing statute. And then the one that Kimmel's holding addresses, which is while awaiting trial. And while we can certainly think of examples, uh, the facts in Kimmel obviously give us some. Um, we have another example, I believe, from Henderson County. This was provided to our office. Um, an individual uh, committed a Class C felony. It was a trafficking and drugs offense. I think there was a possession of handgun charge there. Um, arrested, uh, uh, post bond, is out on bond. So he's aware of these charges, which is a big difference. It's um, and and then commits an assault second degree, which is a C felony, five to ten years. Both of those in that case were enhanceable by a persistent felony offender statute, making that on each of those 
his eligibility would be 20 on each. And um, the effect of the Supreme Court of Kentucky's opinion um, would uh, cap that at 20, as Representative Wilson indicated. So therefore, you get a freebie. Um, That first uh, C felony enhanced to a PFO1. Um, While you're out on bond, you commit that second one, and it um, you, you are not going to face additional time depending on the jury Motion recommendation. The bill. Motion from Senator Wheeler, second from Senator Carroll. Any other questions, members? Senator Neal. Good morning. Uh, how frequent is this occurrence, as you pointed out? I'm not sure if we have statistics on how frequent it happens. I'll say a couple years ago when I was prosecuting, one of my last cases was a uh, a guy convicted felon in possession of a handgun. We had a, a plea agreement of seven years. Uh, somehow, Department of Corrections ran it con- concurrent to whatever he was being paroled on, and he was out of prison within three months. Mm-hmm. And this guy had a very violent history, and he was driving around with a gun in his pocket, which is against the law. I, I was prosecuted for four or five years, and I can think of times it's happened to me. I don't know. I They may have statistics. I'm not sure. But it's been in front of the Supreme Court. They've made a ruling that is is essentially allowing people a get-out-of-jail-free card. And, and it's and it's our violent offenders, our, our people who are already convicted or are waiting trial on other offenses that are getting this. And I think it's just an inconsistency in our sentencing statutes that simply just needed addressed, it, and and that's what I hope House Bill six one nine can do. Do you know? I am not aware of statistics. I think it's a, a very good question, and anecdotally as well, it has happened on my cases. A few more pertaining to the on probation or parole. Um, so I would imagine that the awaiting trial provision is less frequent. How w- I would add, though, I think that sort of conduct of committing felonies while on awaiting trial are the people, while maybe less, are the ones that we should be especially concerned about. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Seeing none, got a motion and a second on the bill. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Berg. Aye. Senator Carroll. Aye. Senator Deneen. Aye. Senator Neal. I'm, I'm, if I can explain my past vote, I'm, yes. I'm going to seek that information. I'd like to know more about the available information before <coughs> I commit on this particular regard. But thank you for bringing it. Senator Schickel. Senator Stivers. Senator Storm. Aye. Senator Turner. Aye. Senator Wheeler. Aye. Chair Westerfield. Aye. Bill passes with favorable expression, 7 to 1, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or 7 to 0 to 1. Uh, that one being a pass. Um, thank you, Representative. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Uh, seeing no other business come before the committee, uh, stay tuned for any future committee meeting notices. But for now, we stand adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>